So how serious is this Oracle versus Google lawsuit? They're asking for billions of dollars. Uh, it's a big deal. It's a big deal and it's not something. In a quiet courtroom in Washington, hundreds of pages of legal argument distilled down to a dispute over roughly 11,500 lines of code. On one side stood Oracle America, custodian of the Java programming language first designed by James Gosling at Sun Microsystems in the mid-1990s. On the other side stood Google, whose Android operating system now runs on the majority of smartphones on Earth. Behind the formal language of briefs and opinions, the fight was about something simple and unnerving. Who controls the recipes that programmers use to talk to machines? To understand why those lines mattered, it helps to slow down and look at the technology itself. An Application Programming Interface, or API, is a contract. It is the tidy front desk in a busy hotel, the place where guests drop off requests without ever seeing the chaos in the back rooms. In more concrete terms, an API is a set of method names, parameters, and organizational structure that tell one piece of software how to ask another piece of software for work. Many educators use a restaurant analogy. The menu is the API. The dishes are the functionality. The kitchen is the hidden implementation. Customers do not care how the sauce is made as long as the same dish arrives when they order it. Java's APIs became the global menu for serious computing. Designed at Sun Microsystems and released in the mid-1990s, Java promised that code written once could run anywhere thanks to a virtual machine and a standard library that wrapped up everything from strings and dates to network connections. Over time, banks, airlines, payment networks, core banking platforms like TCS, BNCS, and media companies such as Netflix built their backends on Java and its standard APIs, because stability and portability mattered more than fashion. Java now runs in aircraft avionics, banking systems, social networks, and even tiny smart cards that live inside passports and credit cards. Android entered this story as a hungry new platform. Google wanted a mobile operating system that could attract developers quickly. The world already had millions of Java programmers who knew the standard Java APIs by heart. Rather than invent a new vocabulary, Google wrote its own implementation of many Java functions but reused the structure and names of 37 Java API packages, about 11,500 lines of so-called declaring code. It was as if someone had rebuilt an entire kitchen from scratch, but kept the same menu so that the wait staff and regulars would not have to relearn every order. Then the ownership of that menu changed. In the late 2000s, Oracle acquired Sun Microsystems in a deal valued at roughly $7.5 billion, taking control of Java's trademarks and licensing revenue. Oracle, led by its founder and chief executive Larry Ellison, had built an empire on database software and licenses that turned code into a steady financial stream. The company looked at Android, saw a rapidly growing mobile ecosystem built on familiar Java-style APIs, and decided those 11,500 lines were not harmless scaffolding, but valuable intellectual property. In 2010, Oracle sued Google in federal court in California, alleging that Android infringed both patents and copyrights related to Java. The patents fell away at trial. What remained was the more abstract and more dangerous question. Are APIs themselves covered by copyright law? And if so, can a company recreate them without permission in the name of interoperability and developer convenience? The trial was assigned to Judge William Alsop, who learned Java well enough to read code directly and initially concluded that the structure of the APIs was not copyrightable. The Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit later reversed that view, holding that APIs could be protected. The courtroom door creaked open on a new kind of monopoly, not just over how code is written, but over how developers even phrase their requests. The legal controversy grew over a decade. Oracle argued that Google had taken the heart of Java's creative structure without a license, insisting that companies should pay to use those interfaces in competing platforms. Oracle's damages estimates rose over time. During one phase of the case, an Oracle lawyer stated that Android had generated about $31 billion in revenue and $22 billion in profit for Google, and later filings suggested Oracle might pursue more than $8 billion in damages, with outside estimates climbing toward tens of billions. These are the kind of numbers that make executives and investors lean forward in their chairs. Android itself, according to market reports, 
was powering well over three quarters of smartphones worldwide, turning this dispute into a tollbooth fight at the entrance to the mobile era. Around the case, a ring of institutions formed. The Trump administration's Solicitor General urged the Supreme Court not to hear Google's appeal, siding with Oracle's expansive view of copyright in software interfaces. At the same time, a coalition of technology companies and civil society groups filed friend-of-the-court briefs supporting Google. Microsoft, IBM, Red Hat, Mozilla, and more than 150 computer scientists and academics warned that letting a single company lock up APIs would threaten interoperability across the industry. The Electronic Frontier Foundation tracked the case for years, arguing that free re-implementation of APIs is essential for competition, open source software, and the freedom to leave one platform for another. For developers, the stakes were more personal. Libraries and Software Development Kits, or SDKs, are the toolboxes they live in every day. A library is a reusable bundle of code, like a set of well-sharpened chisels. An SDK is the full carpentry kit that includes tools, manuals, and templates for building on a platform, whether that is Android, iOS, or a cloud service. Both rely on stable APIs. When a programmer writes collections, sort in Java, or calls a method in a cloud SDK, they are depending on those interface names remaining accessible and on the idea that alternative implementations can exist. The fear was simple. If every familiar menu could be walled off behind copyright claims, then each technology stack could become a closed city, where leaving carried a legal penalty. After years of conflicting rulings, the dispute reached the Supreme Court of the United States. In early 2021, Justice Stephen Breyer wrote the majority opinion for a 6-2 decision that treated Google's copying of the Java API declarations as fair use under copyright law. The court assumed without deciding that the APIs might be copyrightable, then walked through the four statutory factors. It noted that the code was declaring code that organized functionality rather than implementing it, that Google used a small fraction of the Java platform, that the purpose was to allow programmers to apply existing skills in a new smartphone environment, and that locking down the APIs would risk harm to the public by handing a single company control over a key interface. Justice Clarence Thomas, joined by Justice Samuel Alito, dissented, warning that the majority's distinction between declaring and implementing code could erode protection for software. Legally, the ruling was a decisive victory for Google. It reversed the federal circuit and effectively ended Oracle's claim to billions in damages. It also did something more subtle. By characterizing APIs as functional organizing code that sits closer to ideas and systems than to pure creative expression, the court gave comfort to generations of developers who had built compatible implementations of interfaces, from open source database drivers to networking stacks and industry standards like the Java-based J or XFS API used in automated telemachines. The decision signaled that reusing the vocabulary of an interface in order to build a fresh implementation can fall within fair use when it opens new platforms and does not simply duplicate an existing product. Financially, however, the story did not end with a single verdict. Oracle continued to insist publicly that Google had stolen Java, while the market quietly absorbed the message that APIs are safer terrain for reuse than they might have been. Google kept Android free to device makers, making money instead on advertising, app store revenue and data, a business model that turned the Android ecosystem into a river of cash. Oracle deepened its focus on cloud services, enterprise licenses and specialized Java offerings such as Java Card for smart cards and secure elements in phones and passports. The revenue flowing from Java, whether through licenses or through services delivered on top of Java platforms, remained vast even though this one lawsuit failed to create a new toll on the Android highway. Politically, the case exposed a fault line in how societies think about software ownership. One camp, represented by Oracle and some policymakers, sees strong proprietary rights over everything from interfaces to algorithms as a way to reward investment. Another camp, represented by open source advocates and many large cloud companies, treats shared interfaces as a form of infrastructure closer to a language or a road network than to a novel. The outcome of Google v Oracle did not end that debate. It did, however, tilt the balance slightly toward viewing APIs as connective tissue that benefits from being open to re-implementation, 
a view aligned with earlier decisions on interoperability in cases involving reverse engineering of game consoles and printer cartridges. Technically, the decision turned on a subtle distinction that matters deeply to programmers. Declaring code sets out names and types. It is the table of contents and the index. Implementing code is the story itself, the algorithms and data structures that perform the work. By treating Google's reuse of declarations as a fair use, when coupled with a fresh implementation, the court preserved a long tradition of building compatible systems. Operating systems that can run software written for their rivals, databases that accept familiar query interfaces, and tools that talk to multiple cloud providers all depend on that ability to speak someone else's language without copying their internal machinery. For Java, this meant that programmers could continue to trust that their investment in learning the APIs had value beyond one vendor's licensing strategy. The broader impact on humans and on the planet is hidden behind these abstractions. Android, built on re-implemented Java-style APIs, became the operating system for the majority of the world's smartphones. That choice shaped how billions of people communicate, bank, study, and work. In countries where desktop computers never became widespread, Inexpensive Android phones provided a first, and sometimes only, connection to the internet. The energy and material footprint of producing and powering those devices is enormous. Tying the API war in a distant courtroom to mines in Africa, assembly lines in Asia, cell towers on remote hills, and data centers humming in cold climates. An apparently narrow question of copyright in a few thousand lines of code turned out to be entangled with how humanity accesses information and how much strain that access places on physical infrastructure. At the same time, Java and its APIs continue to underpin critical systems. Core banking platforms process payments and loans. Streaming platforms such as Netflix delivered films and series over Java-based microservices. Smart cards and identity systems use Java Card to secure credentials in millions of pockets. Banks relied on Java precisely because it offered reliability and security for large volumes of transactions. When a person taps a card at an automated teller or opens an app to transfer money, they are leaning on a web of Java APIs and implementations that stretch from phones to mainframes. The court's affirmation of fair use for compatible interfaces protected not only a single company, but an ecosystem of dependent institutions and everyday activities. For libraries and SDKs, the outcome framed the future of reuse. It reassured maintainers of open source projects who re-implement cloud APIs so that developers can switch providers. It calmed fears in communities that maintain alternative runtimes for languages, such as OpenJDK for Java, that they might face new waves of litigation. It also set expectations for newer platforms. When companies design APIs for machine learning services, payment gateways or messaging layers, they now do so in a legal environment that recognizes that others may lawfully mirror the interface in pursuit of interoperability, as long as they do their own engineering underneath. That prospect encourages competition while still leaving room for proprietary innovation in implementation details and surrounding services. None of this resolved the tension that runs through modern programming culture. Software is built from layers of prior work. A new mobile app rests on frameworks, which rest on operating systems, which rest on drivers and firmware and microcode. Every layer exposes APIs that are both technical and social contracts. The Google V. Oracle battle forced judges, corporate leaders and developers to say aloud what had often been implicit. That progress in computing depends on reuse, on being able to stand on someone else's shoulders without asking permission for every word in the shared vocabulary. The decision did not grant a blanket license to copy any interface in any context, yet it drew a careful line that future courts will revisit as technology moves into areas like artificial intelligence, where models and APIs intertwine. In the end, the so-called API war between Google and Oracle was about more than Java, more than Android, more than two companies wrestling over a share of mobile profits. It was a test of whether software development would harden into feudal territories or remain a porous landscape of shared concepts and competing implementations. The Supreme Court chose the latter, at least for now. In server rooms, co-working spaces and solitary bedrooms where programmers write code late into the night, that choice continues to ripple outward. Each time a developer reaches for a familiar library or ports an application to a new platform, without rewriting every call. They are quietly living in the world that Case constructed.
a world where the vocabulary of code remains, for the most part, a common language rather than a private weapon.